we are going to bring up now um, tonight's program that I've uh, put together here. As I say, it's a great pleasure uh, on behalf of the University of Mary Washington, the James Monroe Museum, uh, which is one of our university uh, museums, to be able to do this program uh, uh, with uh, the folks with the James K. Polk uh, Home and Museum. And um, we, we love the opportunity to collaborate. And uh, in this case, as Thomas said in the introduction, uh, I think there's some very close parallels between some of the actions of James Monroe and James K. Polk. Let's uh, start by taking a look at this map showing major acquisitions of territory by the United States. The ones in red, we will credit to James Monroe and the ones in blue to James K. Polk. Now, um, Monroe gets points for the Louisiana Purchase, even though it occurred in the administration of Thomas Jefferson. I'll explain that later on. I show this map to set the stage for two principal themes of my remarks this evening. Number one, that James Monroe and James K. Polk played key roles in securing for the United States more than half of the nation's territory prior to the additions uh, of Alaska and Hawaii. And secondly, Monroe's presidential actions in foreign policy and in military administration were vital to the later success of Polk's own presidential agenda. Now, I'm assuming the audience uh, of Polk's America knows a good deal about James K. Polk, and I do not pretend to be an expert at all on him, and so I'm going to stay more in my wheelhouse talking a bit about James Monroe, giving some background on him, uh, and even in that, painting with a fairly broad brush, because there's a long and varied career that Monroe pursued in public service. But we're going to hit a few highlights that I think help set an appropriate background to the context of this program. James Monroe was born in Westmoreland County, Virginia on April 28, 1758. While the Monroe family land holdings were not as large as those of some of their neighbors like the Washingtons and the Lees, uh, the family did live comfortably. They were able to send their eldest son to the College of William and Mary in the colonial capital of Williamsburg. Monroe enrolled at William and Mary in June of 1744 and like so many of his classmates, was soon caught up in revolutionary fervor. He was part of a group of students who seized arms from the governor's palace on June 24th, 1775. In February, 1776, Monroe was commissioned a lieutenant in the 3rd Virginia Infantry Regiment. For the next two years, as George Washington led the Continental Army in victory and defeat, uh, more often the latter, James Monroe took part in the battles of Harlem Heights, Brandywine, Germantown, and Monmouth, and was uh, a major in the Continental Army before his 20th birthday. Monroe was also at the Battle of Trenton, where Washington's gamble in attacking an isolated Hessian outpost paid off in an inspiring victory on the day after Christmas, 1776. Uh, this is Emanuel Loitze's wonderful painting of Washington crossing the Delaware, which so many people are familiar with, and it's glorious, it's wonderful, it's wrong in just about every detail, um, and in, in other talks I do, I go into great detail ex uh, exposing all the things wrong with this image, um, not the least of which is it's awfully bright for a night crossing, um, but one thing that we can say is accurate uh, is that uh, George Washington was in the boat. Uh, we don't think he was standing. We do know that James Monroe, who was depicted behind him holding the flag, was not in the boat, and we will explore why here in a second. But it is uh, a great iconic image, and it's important because the Battle of Trenton produced Monroe's greatest moments of both peril and fame during the Revolutionary War. And he described this in his uh, autobiography that he wrote late in life. He never finished it, and he wrote it in the third person, but he gave an account of what happened at Trenton. Command of the vanguard of the Continental Army, consisting of 50 men, was given to Captain William Washington of the 3rd Virginia Regiment. Lieutenant Monroe promptly offered his services to act as a subaltern under him. On the 25th of December, 1776, they passed the Delaware in front of the Army in the dusk of the evening. And then the next morning, uh, the battle was joined, and again I read from Monroe's account of it in his autobiography. Captain William Washington then moved forward with the vanguard in front, attacked the enemy's picket, shot down the commanding officer, and drove the picket before him. 
The drums were beat to arms and two cannon were placed in the main street to bear on the head of our column as it entered. Captain Washington rushed forward, attacked, and took possession of them. He received a severe wound and was taken from the field. The command then devolved upon Lieutenant Monroe, who attacked in like manner at the head of the corps and was shot down by a musket ball, which passed through his breast and shoulder. He was also carried from the field. Monroe and William Washington were brought to a makeshift hospital uh, just off of uh, the, the battlefield there of Trenton. And a doctor, John Riker, whom Monroe had literally met just hours before on the way uh, to the town, uh, repaired Monroe's shoulder. An artery had been uh, uh, nicked and uh, he had the danger of bleeding out. Dr. Riker saved his life by tying off that artery. And this painting uh, of the capture of the Hessians at Trenton by John Trumbull shows uh, William Washington standing to the right uh, with his bandaged hands. And on the uh, other side is James Monroe clutching uh, at his breast there. Um, the, bus the musket ball that came in and wounded him, almost killed him, stayed in his body for the rest of his life. The American Revolution uh, was a transformative experience for Monroe, not just because he got shot and kept the bullet uh, for the rest of his life, but because it inspired his sense of public service, of the importance of the American Revolution as an intellectual and social movement as much as a military revolt against the British. And he noted later in his life, writing to an associate, though young at the commencement of our revolution, I took part in it and its principles have invariably guided me since. Nothing can be more deeply fixed in the judgment and heart of anyone than are the principles of our free system of government in mind. After studying law with Thomas Jefferson, who became his political mentor, and serving in the Virginia House of Delegates and on the Governor's Council of State, James Monroe was elected a Virginia delegate to the Congress of the Confederation, or really the Continental Congress, uh, but called the Congress of the Confederation at this point under the Articles of Confederation, in June of 1783. He was present uh, in December of that year when George Washington resigned his commission as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army. And Monroe is shown here, he's the fellow in the, uh, the dark uh, coat, the yellow waistcoat, and the uh, fashionable pants. He, he, in fact, he looks a bit like Washington. He, he seemed to maybe have copied Washington's style of dress a little bit there. Um, so as, as so many times in his career, Monroe would be in, if I may use the term, in the room where it happened, uh, with some of the other great moments occurring during his uh, life and career. Monroe in Congress was an advocate for westward expansion, including American control of the Mississippi River, the Port of New Orleans, which was then held by Spain. These goals uh, would figure prominently in his subsequent career in government and diplomacy. After adoption of the Constitution, the first two-party system in American politics pitted the Federalists against the Democratic Republicans, or simply Republicans. And Thomas Jefferson, Secretary of State in the Washington administration, was the acknowledged leader of the Republicans. Uh, you know, the Federalist leader was that guy, uh, what is his name, Hamilton, I think. You know, some people may remember him. Uh, but Jefferson, leading the, the Republicans, um, counted upon the steadfast support in the House of Representatives of one of his protégés, uh, James Madison, and of another of his protégés, James Monroe, in the United States Senate. Uh, Monroe took his seat in that body in 1790. This triumvirate of political allies and personal friends uh, who experienced ups and downs throughout the course of their, their official and personal relationships, uh, had a profound impact on American history, including uh, the expansion of the nation's territory. When he was president, Thomas Jefferson sent James Monroe to France in 1803 to join Robert Livingston in negotiating the purchase of the Port of New Orleans, by this time a French possession. Instead, Monroe and Livingston received the surprising offer uh, from Napoleon Bonaparte, as uh, conveyed by the French treasurer, Francois Barbery Mabois, uh, the offer of the entire Louisiana territory, uh, just to buy it outright. Um, they accepted. They weren't able to exactly phone home and ask for instructions, but they did know how to reach the uh, United States uh, Credit, uh, bankers, uh, credit extenders in Holland, and they quickly found the money to buy the Louisiana Territory, uh, adding over 60,000, 600,000 square miles 
to the United States. Uh, and this is why I give Monroe credit uh, for the Louisiana Purchase, as I did in the opening there, showing that map. Um, though, to be honest, uh, in sports terms, you could say he gets an assist. Uh, Monroe is standing uh, at left in this bas relief, uh, kind of smirking over the signing of the treaty. Um, uh, this is a piece in the collection of the James Monroe Museum. The treasurer, uh, Marbois, is standing up on the other side. Robert Livingston is seated at the table, and regrettably, in the course of time, the, he lost his hands in the sculpture, so it's a little debilitating to him. But this is a, a piece that uh, very vividly depicts uh, the fact that even though it's an assist, Monroe is there to help close the deal on this first really huge expansion of United States territory. Monroe began his presidential term in 1817 by embarking on the first of three tours of the country that he would make. He traveled through the northern states and territories in 1817. He cruised the Chesapeake Bay region in 1818, and in 1819 spent five months visiting the states of the South and the West. The popularity of these presidential excursions, particularly the first one to the North, produced what one newspaper called an era of good feelings in the country, and that term endures as a catchphrase of Monroe's administration. The tours also reflected Monroe's continued focus on westward expansion and military preparedness. This was particularly true in the tour of the southern states that he did in 1819. Uh, you can see the course that, that he followed going along the seacoast first, hitting a number of different locations there, and then moving inland to swing out, <coughs> excuse me, through uh, not only um, the Carolinas, Georgia, uh, going Alabama, going up into uh, Tennessee. Uh, looping back through Kentucky and then coming through Virginia, as it looked in, in those days prior to 1863, um, really uh, hitting what was then uh, the frontier, uh, sort of the outer vanguard of the westward expansion that, that was already well underway. Monroe would push Congress with limited success towards strengthening the na nation's seacoast defenses, Fortress Monroe in Hampton, Virginia, one of the examples of, of one of the forts that were authorized. But he would also seek to expand fortifications and settlements in the West. Monroe's military service in the Revolutionary War that we looked at earlier, and his role as interim Secretary of War in James Madison's administration, Monroe was both Secretary of State and for a while Secretary of War. Uh, these experiences gave him uh, an informed perspective on both the limits and the potential of American military and naval power. He had been present at the Battle of Bladensburg on August 24th, 1814, when the invading British army routed a scratch collection of uh, regular troops and local militia um, on their way to going to sack the uh, nation's capital, burning the White House and Congress and other buildings in Washington, DC. So Monroe had the direct military experience of what uh, untrained or poorly equipped or sort of casually called up militia or volunteers uh, the experience they would have, the disaster that could uh, come from them facing disciplined regular troops. And that uh, example would not be lost on him. The experiences led Monroe away from the traditional Republican opposition uh, that his party had of a large standing army and Navy to a more nationalist point of view. And the conviction that such institutions, rather than being threats to American liberties, were in fact necessary for their preservation. He persuaded Congress to enact reforms that improved the professionalism and adaptability of the U.S. Army. The military academy at West Point became more effective in training a professional officer corps, and the organization and training of the small standing army provided a nucleus of leadership that could absorb large numbers of state volunteer units that would be deployed during times of war. Uh, this is an organization of the officer corps and an emphasis on professionalism that has been cited by a number of authors as having a profound impact down the years, really until the beginning of the 20th century. There was not another major focus on the uh, administration and training of the officers and regulars of the U.S. Army until the post-Spanish American War period. So Monroe's influence in how the army conducted itself, how it would serve in peace and prepare for war, uh, was as about as lasting as some of his diplomatic uh, impacts. Now, when James K. Polk committed the army 
to the Mexican War, the senior leadership, such as Zachary Taylor here uh, at top and Winfield Scott uh, below, were not products of these Monroe era army reforms, but a fair number of the West Point graduates who ended up serving in Mexico were part of the, the result of that process that Monroe began. And um, as is uh, known, I'm sure to many viewers of Polk's America uh, alluded to uh, uh, in some conversations I, I had with the staff beforehand, uh, and what Thomas said in the introduction, um, the influence of Mexico on the Civil War, the Mexican War on the Civil War is, is profound. And many of the uh, leaders, generals, and others uh, of the Civil War really cut their teeth in combat in Mexico. And a few of those that we can uh, look at briefly are Thomas Jonathan Jackson, later Stonewall Jackson, George B. McClellan, twice commander of the Union Army of the Potomac, and the man who had his number pretty much read by this guy, Robert E. Lee, uh, really considered one of the rising stars of the U.S. Army during the Mexican War and right up to the point where he turned down his old commander, Winfield Scott, to command the U.S. Army in 1861 and join the Confederacy. Uh, an officer who was about on the opposite end of the success scale in many ways uh, in the pre-war Army uh, to Robert E. Lee was Ulysses S. Grant who was noted for bravery and horsemanship, but really would not come into his own as a leader until many years after Mexico, facing Lee uh, uh, finally in the, uh, the ending of the Civil War. And uh, Jefferson Davis, a West Point graduate, um, not uh, one who would take his military experience in Mexico into the army when the Civil War began as much as he wanted to, but he would become president of the Confederacy. And in case you're wondering, and I guess just for balance here, uh, Davis's counterpoint, uh, counterpart, Union American President uh, Abraham Lincoln, was a member of Congress during the Mexican War and would, in fact, become a critic of the Polk administration's handling of the conflict. Polk applied uh, the same principle to the development of the U.S. Navy during his presidential administration that Monroe had done uh, to the development of the Army. While the first school of naval instruction uh, for the U.S. Navy was held in 1821 during Monroe's second term. The Naval Academy itself at Annapolis was established in 1845 by Polk's Navy Secretary George Bancroft. Annapolis played a role similar to that of West Point in training a corps of professional naval and marine officers that was the nucleus of a larger Navy in wartime, including the Mexican War and the Civil War. In foreign affairs, James Monroe, as president, continued to pursue the goals that harken back to the early periods of his career in government and diplomacy. And Secretary of State John Quincy Adams was a key partner in this agenda. The question of competing British and American claims in Oregon was addressed when Adams negotiated a convention or treaty with Great Britain in 1818 that established the border between British North America and the United States east of the Continental Divide along the 49th parallel of latitude. The convention provided for joint Anglo-American occupancy uh, of the area west of the Great Divide. And the implications of this expedient arrangement, uh, which neither side was really satisfied with, but they, they figured they would try it until they could figure out a more lasting uh, final result, uh, the implications of this would loom large during Polk's administration. Secretary Adams' negotiation in 1819 of a treaty with Spanish diplomat Luis de Onis de Gonzalez Vara fulfilled a cherished American goal of acquiring all of the Florida territory, really two sections, east and west in those days. The, the, what we now call the state of Florida was called the Floridas, plural at that time. And for much of his career, uh, leading up to the presidency, Monroe had sought ways to try and acquire that property for the United States. It was finally done through the adams onis Treaty in 1819. Uh, an interesting uh, other element to this that has a bearing on what would come later for Polk is that the United States, in addition to getting Florida and a few other arrangements within the adams onis Treaty, also, uh, for at least the time being, surrendered its claims to the Texas uh, territory that was held by Spain. During the same period where there are diplomatic movements going on uh, within uh, the continental United States, where there, where there is also this emphasis on military reform, 
The Monroe administration uh, was recognizing the independence of Latin American republics that had fought for their independence from uh, Spain and Portugal. And thus the US was one of the first nations to recognize the newly independent republics of Chile, Peru, Colombia, Mexico, and what is today uh, Argentina. Worried about stability in Latin America and wary of Russian imperialist claims on the Pacific coast of uh, North America, Monroe made a foreign policy statement that would be the most enduring legacy of his presidency. He declared in his annual message to Congress on December 2nd, 1823, the doctrine that would eventually bear his name. His warning to Congress, uh, excuse me, his warning to Europe against interfering in the affairs of the Western Hemisphere would be a cornerstone of American foreign policy for generations. And the operative sentence, the one that is most often quoted to really be the, the essence of the Monroe Doctrine is this, the American continents by the free and independent condition which they have assumed and maintained are henceforth not to be considered as objects for future colonization by any European power. Well, the Monroe Doctrine found an enthusiastic advocate in James K. Polk, who readily acknowledged his endorsement of its precepts. The doctrine figured prominently in Polk's first annual message to Congress on December 2nd, 1845, uh, in a section where he declared that any independent state on the North American continent, and this was a thinly veiled reference to Republic of Texas, uh, had the right to seek union with the United States, if it so desired, without European interference. And in asserting this, he had this passage uh, in his message. We can never consent that European powers shall interfere to prevent such a union because it might disturb the balance of power, which they may desire to maintain upon this continent. Near a quarter of a century ago, the principle was distinctly announced to the world in the annual message of one of my predecessors that, and this will sound familiar, the American continents by the free and independent condition which they have assumed and maintain are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for colonization by any European powers. This principle will apply with greatly increased force should any European power attempt to establish any new colony in North America. In the existing circumstances of the world, the present is deemed a proper occasion to reiterate and reaffirm the principle avowed by Mr. Monroe and to state my cordial concurrence in its wisdom and sound policy. Polk's message also, uh, this annual message in 1845, cited actions taken during the administrations of James Monroe and John Quincy Adams with respect to Oregon. The disputed territory uh, at that time bordered on Russian, British, and Mexican holdings, as well as the expanding U.S. border, and the territory had been covered in whole or in part by all of these nations. And so in his address, uh, again, um, Polk devotes some attention to a sort of historical review of things that had led up to what he found when he assumed the presidency with regard to Oregon. He said, my attention was early directed to the negotiations, which on the 4th of March last, his inauguration day, I found pending at Washington between the United States and Great Britain on the subject of the Oregon Territory. Three several attempts had been previously made to settle the questions in dispute between the two countries by negotiation upon the principle of compromise, but each had proved unsuccessful. These negotiations took place at London in the years 1818, 1824, and 1826, the first two under the administration of Mr. Monroe and the last under that of Mr. Adams. The negotiation of 1818, having failed to accomplish its object, resulted in the convention of the 20th of October of that year, the convention that involved a, a joint administrative agreement between Great Britain and the United States over Oregon. Now, when, Monroe, uh, when uh, Polk is coming into office, he is uh, prepared to do a little gamesmanship in his negotiations with the British over the fate of uh, Oregon. There were competing interests within the United States, uh, even competing interests within the Democratic Party, to which Polk uh, was ostensibly the leader as president, over what to ask for, what to, what to fight for, potentially. Uh, was it up to 5440, the extreme uh, US claim that was right up against Russia and Alaska? Or was it further down uh, to the south, 
uh, in the area along the 49th parallel. And uh, between these two goalposts was a great deal of the uh, agitation uh, within the United States and in the relationship with Great Britain. And at the start of his administration's negotiations with the British on Oregon, Pope declared that the U.S. wanted all the territory, right up to 50, all the territory, right up to 5440. 5440 or fight uh, was the, uh, the slogan of the day. Despite the misgivings of his Secretary of State, James Buchanan, the president's shrewd bluster earned him, in the end, a compromise rather than war with the British. In spite of his own supporters' more extreme demands, in many cases, Polk agreed to a boundary at the 49th parallel, which still gave the United States, the present-day uh, states of Oregon, Idaho, and Washington, as well as, and this was important, uh, control of the Columbia River. Texas was another major issue as Polk assumed the presidency. During the 1844 election, this pro-democratic uh, cartoon predicted the collapse of Whig opposition to the annexation of Texas by the United States. Polk, uh, who is, of course, the expansionist candidate, the candidate is uh, shown over here on the right. Um, he's standing uh, at a bridge over what's called the Salt River at that point there, and he's holding an American flag, and he's waving to uh, Stephen Austin and Sam Houston, who are in this really fascinating sort of wheeled uh, steamboat type of thing going over the bridge here. It's, uh, it's, it's Texas uh, as depicted by a little boat. And they're just overjoyed uh, to see James K. Polk, uh, the friend, I think they misspelled it there, uh, of our country, of our Republic of Texas. Uh, and there's so much other symbolism here. And you see uh, the uh, unsuccessful attempts uh, to try and forestall all this of Henry Clay, the presidential candidate for the Whigs, Theodore uh, Frelinghuysen, uh, Daniel Webster, Henry Wise of Virginia, all attempting to undo this and all uh, failing in the effort. Um, you even have William Lloyd Garrison coming in, uh, representing the, the influence of the anti-slavery movement, the abolition movement, uh, in this discussion of Texas and the implications for what it could mean to slaveholding in the country. So uh, political cartoon, as they often do, encapsulating a number of the issues involved in this uh, a uh, very uh, striking uh, role that uh, the annexation of Texas would have on United States politics, as well as its territory. Polk's predecessor, John Tyler of Virginia, signed a bill to annex the Republic of Texas on March 3rd, 1845, his last full day in office. And it was a, sort of an attempt to school uh, Polk a little bit, preempt him uh, from being able to proceed. But after his inauguration the next day, Polk uh, urged Texas to ratify the agreement. And the Republic of Texas did do that uh, in the coming weeks. And after uh, legislation in the U.S. House and Senate were reconciled, Polk signed the final bill on December 29th, 1845, that admitted Texas as the 28th state in the Union. So we've gone back now and sort of disregarded what we'd said in the adams onis Treaty. We're, we're right on the uh, front line here of bringing Texas in. And in asserting the American claims to Oregon and also to Texas and other territory, which Mexico regarded as its own, Pope was fully embracing the concept of manifest destiny, the principle that the core of North America was ordained by God to be dominated by the United States for a whole host of morally and uh, 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 religiously significant uh, advantages that the American nation possessed over uh, those in the way of that expansion. The term was coined during Polk's uh, first year in office, 1845, in an editorial that appeared in the United States Magazine and Democratic Review, a uh, periodical that favored the Democratic Party generally and was very specifically behind the uh, annexation of Texas, the acquisition of Oregon, California, other territories. Um, whether it was John O'Sullivan, the uh, editor, or a fellow Irish-American import, uh, Jane Kasnow, who actually wrote uh, the Manifest Destiny editorials, a bit of, uh, I guess, uh, discussion about that. But uh, the annexation of Texas and the American designs on California and other Mexican territory in fulfillment of Manifest Destiny did lead to the Mexican-American War of 1846-48. I know the map says 1846-47, uh, but uh, final resolution was not till February of 1848. So we'll We'll note that. Time does not permit us this evening to examine the Mexican-American War in detail, but suffice it to say that James K. Polk, uh, while desiring, uh, he said, and I think he did, uh, desire a diplomatic 
resolution to the conflict with Mexico uh, over, over the acquisition of more territory and the fixing of the border. He, he was in favor of diplomacy, but he was not going to let this vast expanse of land uh, that was in the, in the uh, path of America's manifest destiny um, to get away uh, without trying everything, including war, to obtain it. By positioning uh, an American army under Zachary Taylor along the disputed Mexican border and giving Taylor authority to respond forcefully to any hostile moves by Mexican forces, Polk set the stage for uh, the ensuing war. Uh, similarly, with naval forces posted out in California and Mexico, there, there was definite pre-positioning of troops uh, for the possibility of a provoked incident. Uh, this harkens a bit to what uh, James Monroe had done in sending Andrew Jackson into Florida, ostensibly to suppress pirates, uh, and yet also uh, uh, enlarging on that mission in a way that, that sought to try and uh, take Florida for the United States. It, it was one of the things which helped force the adams onis Treaty, this provocative action by Jackson, perhaps exceeding orders, perhaps not. Um, one could make a bit of a leap forward to the Gulf of Tonkin incident or to other incidents in which a, a president or a government might uh, be uh, stacking the deck uh, in terms of events that would lead to a decisive action. But when uh, the American victory in Mexico occurred, as we have seen, it was in part due to uh, the army reforms that began during James Monroe's presidency. So it helps reinforce this fundamental link between the two administrations in war as well as in diplomacy. The Mexican cession of 1848, secured by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, signified the realization of one of Polk's principal goals in pursuit of manifest destiny. And he had acknowledged a, a bit earlier in October of 1845 uh, his foreign policy to uh, debt with uh, to James Monroe um, in in these uh, matters of uh, the territory that was possible uh, from uh, either diplomacy or war with Mexico. He he met with uh, Senator Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri on October 24th, 1845, and as uh, the staff uh, at the Pope Museum well know and, and scholars, uh, thankfully, Pope kept a diary during his White House years and it provides great insight on, on what he experienced. And so he noted in his conversation with Benton, October 24th, 1845, the, the conversation then turned on California, in which I remarked that Great Britain had her eye on that country and intended to possess it if she could, but that the people of the United States would not willingly permit California to pass into the possession of any new colony planted by Great Britain or any foreign uh, monarchy. And then reasserting Mr. Monroe's doctrine I had California and the fine Bay of San Francisco as much in view as Oregon. So again, uh, adroit use uh, by President Polk of the Monroe Doctrine to further the aims of, of another generation beyond Monroe, as he did. Now, um, and I'm sorry, I should have read the quote there uh, uh, while I had it on the screen, but you did, you did get that. While Monroe and Polk were largely successful in their shared quest to expand and strengthen the American nation, their actions came at a high price. Manifest Destiny was a disaster for the native peoples that were dispossessed from their ancestral lands and ravaged by war. Um, and these are some of the principal leaders of the Plains Indian tribes that traveled to Washington uh, to confer with Monroe in 1819. They were painted by Charles Byrd King. You see them wearing peace medals, some of them uh, they all received medals from Monroe. Some of them were marrying, uh, wearing medals from earlier visits to prior administrations. And at that time, uh, or a few years later, Monroe uh, tried to warn Congress uh, of the problems, uh, what he saw as an almost insoluble problem, insolvable problem of integrating uh, the Native peoples into the United States culture. Um, and he was an advocate of removal or separation as a means of trying to overcome this, at least in the short term. And he said in message to Congress, uh, 1825, his last, the removal of the tribes from the territory which they now inhabit would not only shield them from impending ruin, but promote their welfare and happiness. Experience has clearly demonstrated that in their present state, it is, it is impossible to incorporate them in such masses in any form whatever into our system. It is also demonstrated with equal certainty that without a timely anticipation of and provision against 
the dangers to which they are exposed. Under causes which it will be difficult, if not impossible, to control, their degradation and extermination will be inevitable. Not, not pulling any punches on that assertion. Now, moving to Polk's era, this is George uh, C. Ageli Lowry, uh, principal chief of the Eastern Band of the Cherokee, um, and a man who was known uh, uh, as a respected uh, tribal leader, uh, a banker, a soldier, a translator, a planter, did many, many things. Uh, he was the product of a Scottish father and a Cherokee mother. Um, had met with Presidents uh, George Washington and James Monroe, and in fact is wearing, um, this is supported by an unknown artist, he's wearing one of Monroe's peace medals, one of the clearest examples uh, of a native person wearing a Monroe peace medal that we've seen. Uh, this is uh, Monroe's medal at the top, and um, that of uh, James K. Polk at the bottom. And as you can see, uh, with, with only minor changes, um, each president's uh, likeness was put on, uh, but then the back, the, the obverse, or reverse side, excuse me, uh, was essentially the same. Uh, clasp hands over a tomahawk and peace pipe above with peace and friendship um, uh, stated on the, uh, on the back of the medal. Uh, there's a bit of irony in this icon iconography, iconography uh, whether intentional or not. Uh, the white hand on the left uh, is extending from the sleeve of an army uniform. And uh, the fact that the uh, Indian uh, Relations Bureau at that time was in the Department of the Army, the War Department, I should say, tells you something about where the, um, the, the relationship was going. <clears throat> when we look again at the Glorious Manifest Destiny painting, in fact, we see a pretty pain, plain uh, depiction of Native peoples retreating from the march of American progress. The other uh, intensity uh, of conflict that Manifest Destiny produced, of course, uh, was that between the North and the South over the extension, expansion of slavery that would lead to the Civil War and all that followed that cataclysm, even into our present day. This lithograph uh, depicts the extension of slavery through the United States annex annexation of California and Texas. And again, there are many images represented here. Um, an American ne uh, eagle protecting her nest of hatchlings uh, which are California and Texas, from a wolf and an alligator. The wolf, which is in sheep's clothing, uh, is depicted as John Bull, the traditional personification of Great Britain, who's betting Canada, uh, another proposed annexation on this, this, uh, this showdown that's going on. Meanwhile, uh, Spain, uh, represented to a sort of Don Quixote figure, is holding back the alligator, betting Cuba in the discussion, uh, also reflecting American designs on that territory. And in the foreground is an enslaved person, his head in his hands, lamenting uh, what will be his fate from uh, these uh, acquisitions of territory. On his right is the broken, um, uh, excuse me, is the uh, unbroken pot of slavery, and on his left is the broken pot of liberty there near John Ball's, uh, John Ball's foot. And behind them, a, a New York Bowery boy is holding a, a, a banner uh, inscribed the Union Forever. And um, it might be George Washington maybe up there, uh, uh, someone like him uh, encouraging him. So a uh, contemporary depiction of the issues involved with the acquisitions of territory uh, coming out of the Polk administration's uh, efforts, uh, particularly in the Mexican War. And in fact, the battle over slavery and the Mexican-American War um, was joined even before the conflict was formally concluded. On Saturday, August 10th, 1846, President Polk submitted to Congress a request for $2 million in order to facilitate negotiations with Mexico on the final settlement of the war. In response, Pennsylvania Democratic Congressman David Wil Wilmot, showed here, offered a, an amendment to the Appropriations Bill that became known as the Wilmot Proviso. And it said that provided that as an express and fundamental condition to the acquisition of any territory from the Republic of Mexico by the United States, by virtue of any treaty which may be negotiated between them, and by the use of the executive of the monies herein appropriated, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall ever exist in any part of said territory except for crime whereof the party shall first be duly convicted. This is an adaptation of language in the Northwest Ordinance uh, of many years before uh, that was slipped in here in an attempt to um, uh, keep 
uh, slavery uh, from extending as a result of the Mexican acquisitions. Wilmot Proviso provoked a, a huge angry reaction in the South. It failed in Congress, was later issued as a manifesto uh, in this increasingly heated sectional debate. Uh, James Monroe and James K. Polk did not live to witness the growing sectional rupture over slavery that led to the Civil War. Monroe died at his daughter's home in New York City on July 4th, 1831, the third president to succumb on Independence Day after Thomas Jefferson and James, uh, John Adams back in 1826. In 1858, his remains were uh, reinterred, uh, taken from New York City to uh, this grand Gothic tomb in Richmond, Virginia's Hollywood Cemetery, where he is buried with his wife, Elizabeth, and daughter, Mariah. Polk left office on March 4th, 1849, with little more than three months to live. He died, uh, apparently, I believe, from cholera at his Nashville home, Polk Place, on June 15th, 1849. His uh, remains today lie within the stone Greek Revival tomb that was relocated from Polk Place in 1909 to the Tennessee State Capitol grounds. Let us conclude by looking again at the map of American territorial expansion that reflects the efforts of James Monroe and James K. Polk during the first half, roughly, of the 19th century. Both men were convinced of the inevitable dominance of the middle of the North American continent, and perhaps more, by the United States. Both were also convinced of the rightness of their cause. I believe that uh, it is evident that uh, Monroe and uh, James K. Polk were correct in their first conviction that there would be a dominance of the continent by uh, the United States. And in that respect, they were correct. Uh, the judgment of history, uh, the uh, ability for us to determine the true impact of their actions over time uh, are uh, things that are still very much being adjudicated by historians, by social and political scientists, and by the American people. And if, uh, if anything, it uh, reminds us of the words of William Faulkner, who said that the past is never dead. It's not even past. I think that's true as we look at the legacies of James Monroe and James K. Polk. Thank you very much. All right, are we back here? All right, welcome. Hey, thank you so much. That was incredible. Um, so right now we're going to uh, throw it open to the question and answer session. Um, so if you have any questions, you can just uh, go ahead and write them into the Q&A. Um, looks like two conversation bubbles at the bottom of your screen if you're in Zoom here. Um, we do have a couple questions coming in, but I honestly, I had a kind of a burning question going. And I, it's kind of one of those things where like the chicken and the egg situations with the Monroe Doctrine. So I guess I would ask you, do you think when James Monroe made the statement that we now call the Monroe Doctrine, that he realized the importance that those words were going to have kind of going forward into uh, the future there? I'm afraid you're going to have to repeat that one, Thomas, because I totally had a, a fry of the audio. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yeah, no, my question was, um, do you think uh, Monroe knew the importance of those words of the, that would become the Monroe Doctrine whenever he, he made the speech, you know, or did we just attribute that kind of later as historians or as we look at American history? No, there, there was a, a, a pretty good recognition of what the impact of his words would be um, on the immediate situation in terms of forestalling the, the attempts of Great Britain to interfere in some of the uh, Caribbean uh, uh, republics or, or Spain for that matter, trying to maybe get back some of their, their uh, uh, newly independent republics. He had an eye toward Russia uh, and Great Britain in the Pacific Northwest somewhat. He, he's really trying to sort of insulate the continent. And, and actually with the British, uh, ironically though, also sort of on uh, the side of uh, some of this um, in, in other aspects, particularly uh, later on with the uh, carrying on the slave trade, there would be some cooperative work between the United States and some of the other powers in, in attempting to sort of uh, put the Western hemisphere off limits. Um, so there's an immediate short-term impact with regard to uh, the South American republics there was a longer term recognition from the United States that this would be our sphere of influence uh, for better or for worse. And of course, in Latin America, there are, there are mixed feelings 
uh, over the years about the impact of the Monroe Doctrine. Um, uh, at first nurturing these um, uh, new republics and then later dominating them in many ways, economically, politically. Um, Theodore Roosevelt would extend uh, his corollary of the doctrine to justify sending troops uh, down, uh, in some ways to keep the Europeans from doing the same thing over debt issues. Franklin Roosevelt, uh, in his good neighbor policy, would be applying a version of the Monroe Doctrine uh, to try and keep Axis influence out of uh, the hemisphere. Uh, earlier, when the French established a puppet regime in Mexico, uh, the Monroe Doctrine was applied and, and Union Army troops fresh from the war were sent right to the border under William Sherman in case uh, that there had to be a, a confrontation. So um, well into the 20th century, the Cuban Missile Crisis, of course. Monroe couldn't have foreseen all this, but I think early on he did appreciate that the, the, this is something the United States didn't even have the full capacity to enforce in 1823, but the principle would be there and it would be strengthened over time as the nation grew. Um, okay, I got another question. Thank you very much for that answer. That was very helpful. Uh, Daniel asked, uh, he says, I noticed that Monroe's foreign policy accomplishment was often shaped and framed by his cabinet. John Quincy Adams and Calhoun come to mind. However, mm -hmm. there seems to be uh, less consideration for the cabinet during the Polk administration. Could you please speak to the role of the cabinet between uh, the Monroe and Polk administrations? Um, Monroe gathered around him some, some pretty talented men, uh, and they were all men, of course, in both cases, um, who in some cases represented not, not even the most ardent of the, of the Republicans, the Democratic Republicans of his time. He was reaching out to some Federalists. He was, he was trying to take that arrow good feeling things forward. But John Quincy Adams, he, he had a link to the colonial and revolutionary past through his father, as well as a very experienced diplomat uh, that, that Quincy Adams was. But Monroe himself was also an experienced diplomat. I didn't get into it in this presentation, but he had been minister to France, to Great Britain, to Spain. Um, and so his own diplomatic experience informed his outlook on foreign policy, but he benefited enormously from the sort of critical review that John Quincy Adams could provide and the articulation of that into policy. Um, he had John C. Calhoun as his war secretary, and this is the era when Calhoun was much more of a nationalist still, not as much a sectionalist as he would be in the slavery debate. Uh, he had been a war hawk uh, during the, uh, the run-up to the um, War of 1812, so there was, a, there was a shared view of the American role in what would later be called Manifest Destiny, really. Um, even as we say today, American exceptionalism. They all, they all were believing that they were part of something that was exceptional and, and, and transformational for mankind. And Monroe had gotten that by virtue of his Revolutionary War service, and it was carrying on into this. With Polk's administration, obviously y'all can speak much better to it. Um, Polk uh, had, I think, more political considerations that he had to balance in the selection of his cabinet. Um, James Buchanan, uh, carried the weight of his faction of Pennsylvania uh, Democrats uh, into the calculation that Polk had to make uh, in giving him the premier cabinet position of Secretary of State. He was acknowledging the debt to that faction. And, and there was ability on Buchanan's part, but there was also constant calculation. Um, to me, he's much like Salmon P. Chase would be later on in Lincoln's administration with that personal ambition. Um, and so he was often a foil or, or a, a uh, a, a competing voice, a, a negative voice to what Polk wanted to do as Secretary of State. He had to sort of overcome that. And we know that's how Polk saw it because of his diary entries. Um, as far as with the others, with Bancroft, the Navy, and um, I'm blanking on who his army, uh, his war secretary was. I, I think he had a good working relationship and it wasn't so much of a philosophical uh, issue with them. Does that sound basically right? Or? Yeah, so, dur I mean, especially during the um, sort of initial lead up to declaration of war, there was some debate within the cabinet, and specifically, you mentioned Bancroft had expressed that um, he had hesitation about moving forward until there was a really clear act of aggression and thought that maybe some of the other cabinet members were a little more eager for war than he was, but then... Um, once the actual declaration came and Polk asked his cabinet for that support, it was unanimous. So uh, I think ultimately 
Polk was a little bit of a micromanager as an executive. And so mm -hmm. uh, I think it's safe to say that he was sort of driving things in terms of his foreign policy there. And yeah, I don't know that his cabinet was necessarily yes, he as powerful as others, but if that's fair, yeah. I think that's fair. I, do, I think though that true, uh, um, Polk, Polk brought a, a, such a clearly formed vision of what he wanted to accomplish in the office. And, and Monroe did too, but Monroe was just by nature a little more deferential in how he was treating some of the, the, the people he was working with. Um, and I guess uh, Polk's experience, of course, in, in the House and, and, and having been so much a part of the legislative uh, activity uh, leading up to then coming in and, and not having been necessarily expected to be the guy who made it into the White House. He, he was all about, to me, uh, uh, overcoming some of the limited expectations sometimes that were uh, made about him. I have one question here. Uh, Joseph asks, we've seen the issues of slavery and race affect Andrew Jackson's standing among historians and the public. Do you see this happening with Monroe and Polk, who have been consistently well regarded by historians? Um, there is obviously a lot of examination that is going on now in light of contemporary issues and in light of looking more deeply, more critically at how some of our historical narratives of, of uh, figures have come down. And, you know, the founders, uh, in many cases, the Monroe's case, Jefferson's, Washington's, others were slaveholders, Madison. Um, they even, in many cases, understood the, the, the irony, the conflict between the logic of arguing for the rights of all mankind and all men are created equal uh, and holding people in bondage. And, and they, for the most part, didn't resolve it in their own lives or their own personal situation. Monroe's no different really in that. He only manumitted that we're aware of, we think, one enslaved person. He, he bought and sold people uh, regularly, um, uh, particularly if debt became an issue in his life. He sold a good number of people from Highland uh, in Albemarle County, Virginia, down to Florida plantation. Some ran off rather than that happen. Um, it's been great recent research trying to reunite the, some of the branches of those families that, that were divided between two states. Um, so, uh, but at the same time too, Monroe is uh, recognizing uh, certain movements going on, the American Colonization Society being one of the most prominent that are they're looking at things from a somewhat different perspective of um, trying to, uh, you know, in their way of seeing things, come up with a solution to the fact of uh, African Americans in the United States by sending them back, quote unquote, to Africa, which didn't make sense in a lot of respects then, but it, it did occur and Monroe is associated with that effort by the uh, capital of Liberia being named Monrovia in his honor and, and the recognition that he had a role in that particular approach to the idea of reconciling uh, the black and white issues in the country. So um, I think there's a lot of critical examination of that. Monroe has tended to get lumped in with a number of others who were slaveholders who were just being, as a group, delisted from schools and, and other you know, public recognitions. Um, and so I don't know uh, how far, to what extent that will go. There seems to me a sort of a, there's one class that is the founders and their relation, relationship with slavery. And then there are the Confederates and not only the relationship with slavery or Jim Crow, but also the act of having taken up arms against the United States. And that's even more problematic. Um, Polk, I don't believe, uh, and y'all again know better than myself, has been the subject of a lot of attention in that regard. Um, and Monroe hasn't really either. And so I don't know if that will change or not, but uh, who knows? We're just about out of time. Um, we did have a, a question about how, what Monroe considered the border of the Louisiana Purchase versus Jefferson. <laughs> well, or what did the French consider or the Spanish? Uh, that, was, that was part of the problem. Uh, it, it was never uh, always in agreement. Um, I think Monroe, uh, if I'm you know, thinking correctly on it, uh, saw it going to the point pretty much where the Adams and East Treaty finally was working to establish it and, and coming right up against Texas. Um, and of course, it would get down to which river eventually we were talking about when you get into Polk's time. But um, 
Uh, I think Monroe had the interpretation of, of the, the, the greatest extent of Louisiana territory as favored the United States claim in that respect. He didn't really back much off of that. Well, it's eight o'clock, but if you want to finish with uh, maybe telling us a little bit about the James Murrow Museum, and, and you had a, a little few little hints at the collection there, but maybe some of the highlights or or what uh, what some of our viewers here could see if they were to make a trip over to Fredericksburg. Well, sure. Thank you. The James Murrow Museum uh, is the largest collection of artifacts and archives related to our fifth president. It looks at his entire career in uh, government service, his personal life that of his family uh, with uh, furniture, uh, paintings, textiles, any number of things. Um, we're in a site that his law office, uh, it's traditionally understood to occupy in Fredericksburg, Virginia in the 1780s. And it was saved by his descendants in the 1920s, saved from demolition, the building on the site. Um, the building was not there when Monroe owned it. So it was a little bit of, uh, re-interpreting re, uh, the, the property, but it is the, the, the structure that houses this collection. And we have done so much more online activity. Uh, jamesrowmuseum.umw.edu is a website where you can see all the different media that we do uh, in social media. There are links to that as well. And uh, as a part of the University of Mary Washington Museums, uh, James Rowe Museum and Gary Melcher's Home and Studio, our artist uh, residence and studio uh, museum, um, are really both about their missions and about supporting the educational uh, element of the University of Mary Washington and training museum professionals like Candace. So we're very uh, proud to be able to take our uh, museum missions and marry them to an education mission. Absolutely. Well, Thomas, you want to close yeah, this out? Thank so. you so much. Uh, very informative. I know some people had questions that didn't get answered, we didn't have time for. Um, if you want to submit those to us, um, you know, via Hoax America, the website, or other other avenues, we'd be ha we'd be happy to uh, to try and answer them when we can. Um, I we'll be happy. I'll be happy to follow up too in any way. Thank you so much for that. Um, one one announcement: uh, we do do these lectures monthly, and so the next one coming down is June twenty seventh. We're going to have Dr. Peter Guardino from the University of Indiana, uh, and he's the author of a book called The Dead March. He will be sharing his research into the soldiers of the Mexican American War. Um, so very on point for our current discussion. Um, so don't miss that one, June twenty seventh uh, at seven o'clock. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Scott Harris, and. Uh, don't, don't be a stranger. We'll talk to you soon, I hope. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's the awkward ending, right? Yes. Bye, everybody. <laughs>